Kamola. Thanks so much for being on the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited for our conversation. We're going to chat about moving countries, moving places, quitting jobs, my two favorite topics. (laughs) I know. I love those things too. I love to leave a place and I love to leave a job. (laughs) Oh my God. I thought I was the only one. So like sometimes I like leave a job and I'm counting down. I realized it's not just for me. So I'm not going back to it. Mm -hmm. But I think you know, we should normalize that more. We should let people know, you know, that's an option. You can always kind of go off and do your own thing and find your own way. Well, I think when the idea of moving and uprooting your life, whether it's moving cities, moving countries like you did, quitting jobs and kind of that season of change, people are scared as hell of those two things. And But you and I have done those over and over and over again. And I think a lot of people are curious, like, where do you get the courage to do it? You know? I know. I can't imagine because it takes a lot of courage to leave, especially for me. It's also been something like I grew up in a way where all these things are kind of forbidden. Mm. You have your life set out for you for a very long time. I moved to this country. I got a job as an attorney. Like, my parents are all proud. And then I'm like, I, I don't know. This, you know, it got to a point where I realized this is not what I want to do. And for the first time, I kind of give myself permission, do what you want. Don't do this if this isn't what you want to do. So I think it's really scary because it's so uncertain. But how I looked at it was like, right now I'm, I'm 27. Like, okay, so you can spend a couple of years doing things that you think will light you up. You can spend a couple of years experimenting. Because I work with people that are kind of in their 30s or in their 40s. And they're just like, still so miserable about the whole thing. and. To me, I was like, okay, you know, if I feel right now, they'll be like, oh, she's a dummy. She left a good job. And that's fine. (laughs) That's fine right now. But like, if it happened in, I I don't know, 10 years when I have a family, when I have like maybe kids or I have someone really depending on me. And it's not really, I don't have responsibilities. No, I have a mortgage. But somewhere in me, I've had so many of those instances where I just do something and I find a way to survive. So it's a skill I think right now I'm kind of used to, you know, I'll find a way to survive. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to do it. And so it, it takes some faith to do that because you always think about those worst case scenarios, mm-hmm. but somehow you find a way out of that. You really would find a way if you leap. You're not going to end up on the street. It's re- now, that's always what I think when I'm about to leave. Like, oh my God, I'm going to end up on the streets. But, you know, Whenever so I bad. do anything, that's what my parents <laughs> worry about. Yeah, yeah. That's all they worry about. Do you have somewhere to live? Do you have money? And I'm like, that's going to be okay. <laughs> you know, well, you know what? It's easy. You, you, you develop like kind of like a superpower. You realize there's you know, times like sometimes I wasn't sure, okay, how am I going to pay this bill? I need to just get creative. I'm like, okay, I need to do this and I need it to do It has to get that. done. Like, it has to get done. This will get done. You know how you have an assignment that you wait till the last minute mm-hmm. and you're like, it was an assignment that was meant to take three months and you do it in a day. That's exactly how it's going you to be. You still get it done within a way. day. Exactly. Like there's no other choice. Still find a way. So yeah, I think so far, you know, you have to learn. Also being an immigrant from Nigeria, I moved to the U.S. in 2015 from Nigeria. How old were you very quickly. from Nigeria? Or moved from Nigeria, I'm sorry. I moved five years ago. I was 22. 22. So, First yeah, time you ever so. left Nigeria or did you travel around a bit? I had traveled before, but this was the first time I lived somewhere else that wasn't my home. Well, that wasn't my country. And it was so scary because it's also, you're coming from a third world country. You don't really know what to expect. Had you ever been to the States before? I had, but like for a vacation, not really to leave here. So it's it's different. This was just me. Like I literally packed a bag, just a bag. The first time I didn't really even know where I was going to stay. So I stayed with like my dad had a friend. So I stayed there. But it was so far from my school. So during my orientation, I remember like just looking for somewhere. And I found like a motel that was like really close to the school. But it was so scary. Mm -hmm. And I was just, it's so that first few moments, you're just like, okay, this is scary. But you know, you have it. And that is really what immigration is. You just have a dream. Okay, I'm going to do this. And. Somehow I'm going to make something for myself. Mm-hmm. So at that moment, you, it kind of transcends who you are. You're, you just start to think, okay, I need to do something. I, 
I don't even know because when I look back, I'm like, how did I do all that? I remember like my first year of law school because I moved here to and I started law school immediately. You know, I'm not even going to adjust or anything. Mm-hmm. So it was just, I felt so out of place. Like this was just all new for me. And right. I would say if any immigrant is listening, they would so relate to this because I haven't met one person that did not feel like that. So I spoke English in Nigeria, but I came here and your accent is really heavy. So no one so you're really in the understands southern what state. you're saying. It's, it's, it's yeah, but, way of but, life. <laughs> yeah, but also, it's also like, you think you speak English, but suddenly someone doesn't understand you. So I was like, <laughs> oh my God, I really thought I spoke English all this while. So it kind of like, I went back into my shell. I'm not even really trying to communicate with anyone anymore. So well, it's you just like, that. Like, it was like when you're home, you don't think you have an accent, but you go to somewhere no. else. Everyone thinks you have an accent, right? Just kind of shut up from the world because you, you're just like, okay, I'm just going to stick to myself. You start to question yourself, like who you are, what your place is and everything. And it's scary. That's just the thing. You're kind of far away. I didn't know like one person. I made a few friends later that moved from Nigeria. But like those first few months, are scary I just yeah they were so scary like now I think back I'm like oh my god I don't know how I survived this well, right think, now like you're you're moving to another English speaking country and you still feel so out of touch with oh everything oh my god yeah imagine yeah. if someone feels that also doesn't speak the language like I applaud anyone who does that that's, that's I know so I scary. feel so much for that when I see like people I, I really want to be their friend and I'm like oh how is it good and anytime I meet that immigrant so now that's just how it is I really want to be friends with the person because it, it's kind of me looking at myself in the past oh how are you coping how is everything going you really start to see yourself as so small because I think it's also kind of damaging you 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 learn to stop talking and I would say my culture kind of encouraged it, like where I'm from. Like okay. you're meant to be quiet and you're meant to kind of never question authority. And so all these things I'm learning now are kind of new Western values, which okay. are, which is beautiful. So like you learn, you have to speak up, you have to advocate for yourself. That wasn't something I grew up with. So it was always, you have to shrink, you don't have to be heard. Mm. So it was difficult to really navigate anything. And I think that's really part of it kind of different cultures this is a culture that really advocates people being themselves right right you you mean the states or nigeria like in the states yeah oh yeah very individualist yeah oh trust me yeah like in nigeria there are things you don't try you just kind of keep to yourself it has its good sides like the culture Mm -hmm. is also people are very family oriented so like how I moved here and I was a stranger and I wasn't really talking to anybody. It really wouldn't really happen to you in Nigeria. People yeah. are nosy. They like want to be involved in your life. They meet a new person. They're like, hey, come over and they bring you food. <laughs> Where it's I'm beautiful. from is like that too. Yeah. They're like, like, ooh, yeah. there's a new person. Who are you? Yeah, I'm sure that you felt when you got to the States, like no one paid much attention to you. Yeah, no one really noticed. They're like, like, you're oh, on your hey. own. Exactly. And but that's just it here. Like you have neighbors, you don't really talk to them. Like it really doesn't happen where I'm from. Like you put yourself in other people's lives, even if they don't want to be part of it, you mm-hmm. find your way in there. So it's it was all different. I have so many questions for you. So the first one I want to ask you is when you were leaving at 22 from Nigeria, was that kind of going against the grain for you or were or did you see many other people before you kind of leave and move countries? Or within your circle, were you kind of the, the one to do that? Well, so it's actually kind of strange because Nigerians do like to leave. Mm. Like as soon as they kind of afford the plane ticket, like the middle class. In really? The disappears. Yeah, the middle class children. Because. Is that a new generation like I, thing? Yeah, it's kind of a new generation yeah. thing. But it's also because the country has kind of destroyed itself. Right. So people are just looking to leave. Like at that point, there's not a lot of opportunity. Mm-hmm. You can't really get good jobs if you don't have any good connections. So the act of moving here is just to make a living, really. So people are yeah. just trying to be able to afford the basic necessities. It isn't even really about like the big dream of having millions of dollars and all that. So that's not really it's an actually, option. Yeah. Well, when we come here, we try to strive for more. But I'm saying like, even what just gets us here is the fact that you can drive an Uber here and afford an apartment. I will tell you where I'm from. It's not possible. Like right. you don't make that little money and you're able to afford like your basic necessities. That's the it's, one thing that you know how- I, 
I applaud the states for. It's if you really, really put is. your mind to it, there's opportunity everywhere. Trust me, it is. It's, and it's, and, and it's the country is well known for that. And yes, it's hard. Yes, it's I think everyone has people. an even playing field in terms. And that's a really naive thing for me to say. I don't want to say it that way. More so, there's opportunity if you want to make opportunity for yourself. That's true. Well, what I, I'd say, okay, because I know there's a lot going on here and there's also like a lot of inequalities and all that. But what, how I look at it is really, there are places where you really can't just break that ceiling. You need to know someone. Like you could, re- there's no, you there's feel no, Nigeria um, is like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's not based on merit. You Very can old be as money. good as you want to be. Yes. You can be as good as you want to be. Nobody's going to give you a chance. Well, something about this place is very different because you can come knowing no one mm-hmm. and you're able to do things for yourself. Like even just the little things. So, you know, say what you'd say, but I think that's incredible from what I've seen. I really think it's incredible to be able to go somewhere you know no one and be able to make something of yourself. It's incredible. Right. I, I mean, it has its faults, but I, I can't complain about, you know, knowing what I know, where I'm from. What be. was going through your head when you were applying for law schools? Did you apply to law schools all throughout the states or just in Texas? I applied all through, actually. I really came to Houston because I kind of got the best deal. I got like a PAT scholarship. And Good. It was, it was just, yeah, it was easier. But what was going through my head? I don't know what was going through my head. Were you <laughs> nervous? Really it's like, like you've, you'd never really been to Texas before. Did you well, know what you were getting like once? I hadn't been to Houston. I didn't. I was just like, you know, why not take the chance? That was really so, all that was. Going so let to me my ask head. you: When you were kind of picking which law schools to apply for, what like how did you decide? Like the the United States is a huge country. Were you basing it on how good the actual university was? Were you basing it on the city? Like you you know nothing. Like how were you picking where to apply? Google. I was just like on the internet 24 7. Okay, what can I do? You really have to do it all yourself. You know how people here are able to get agencies or people to read your cover letters, all that? I knew nothing. I basically right. got my computer out. I was like, okay, I'm trying to leave. I'm going to apply. So, what are you, what are you Googling? Things. Law schools, United States. And then you're just researching. Yeah, like law that. schools. You're like looking at your website. You're trying to see. Like, I'm looking at your, they're actually like ranking websites that show right. you, like, okay, this law school, this grades, because I had to take the LSAT. So there was all that information. You really have to kind of be a bootstrapper to do what I did because right. it's, it was really daunting. Like, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy at all. And that's why I really know what comes here to study law because mm. it's kind of, it's difficult and it's not something immigrants usually choose. They usually choose like engineering. Engineering is a good field. Because engineering is, it's probably similar in other countries, it's but probably the law similar. is I'm like, it's completely yeah. <laughs> different. Yeah. And especially I, not living here, you don't have already sense of the law. Like you're coming here knowing nothing and then no. have to learn the whole law system here. That's, a, that's exactly. a big, big thing to take on. I, yeah, I kind of always knew I wanted to study law. Yeah, I think you're able to get a job a little more easily than in different sectors because there's so many law firms and you, anyone can just wake up and start. I don't know if that's how it is in other fields because I have friends that are engineers mostly. And it seems like they have just these big companies that hire them and you kind of have to go with the big companies. But it's way more decentralized in the, in the legal field. And so I think the employment options are better. As for immigration, it's not that great for immigration because the immigration policies are different. The U.S. has like very strict immigration, student immigration policies. But because you're immigrating as a student, it's a lot easier, right? And you're getting a scholarship. <laughs> you would think wasn't so. Easy. So talk to me about some of the hoops that you have to go through. Talk to me about, about the processes. I don't even know where to start from. In the U.S., it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> okay, tell, okay, maybe just tell me all the ridiculous parts of it. Well, so it's kind of ridiculous because you are here, you have to go to school, you have to stay in status, you're not allowed to work during school. So like, literally, if you wanted to make job working at McDonald's, you're not allowed to do it. Yeah, yeah, As an immigration student? Why? Yes, as an international student, you're just banned from working. You can work on school on certain things on campus, but generally you're not allowed to work. If you want to work, you have to get like a special permit. You have to register for a class. You have to say the work is related to your degree. So you have to make sure the work is related to your degree. 
And a lot of people are kind of looking for ways to pay their tuition too, because, you know, they're trying to, they, they don't really get the best in terms of loans and all that. It's not very good. You can't take federal loans and all that. So we're also trying to work and to make money, but a lot of that is kind of closed off from you. And then after that, you have 90 days to find a job after you graduate or leave the country. 90 yeah, days? So, yeah. It's not a long time. It's not a long time. So people are like, at that point, you're kind of desperate. You're like, I need a job because if I don't have a job. And do you have, have job, to have a job within your field or can you just get any job? You have to have a job within your field. You're literally not allowed to have any job. And if you're trying to stay here, they have to pay you like a certain, they're not allowed to pay you anything. There's a floor. So basically, you have to pay that bill with certain amounts for them to even sponsor you. So it's really complicated. And yeah. your life is tied to your employer. So it's hard to quit jobs. You jumped all that hoops and then you realize, oh my God, <laughs> I really am tied to how much I can work here. You know, if someone is willing to hire me. So it's a, like my sister. You, ha- you, have, you feel a little bit indebted to them. Like you have some loyalty to them because they're helping you well, get residency. It's also more anxiety. It's really not, it's really, okay, if I lose my job, what happens? Or you'll literally get deported. Or what if I can't, yeah. Or what if I can't find a job? Or what if, yeah. Especially with, when COVID happened. And I also think there's like a weird rule where I'm not allowed to work remotely. I'm not sure. I'm not sure of that one. But I know my friend was like worried. Like, what? It's so, right. like, so many hoops. There's so many hoops you have to jump. So now most people that move out of Nigeria try to move to Canada, not to mm. the U.S. Because there's just crazy a crazy amount of restrictions on how you can work how you can actually eventually immigrate here it takes a long time so right. i want to hear some of the stories of when you first moved to the states and just tell me some funny stories where you're like oh my god i'm such an immigrant right now i mean like eventually when i really tried to adjust and i made friends everyone was pretty kind of nice they say things differently I know, like, I say some things and they're like, no, you say it differently. So we, um, Nigeria is like mostly British English, not yes. American English. So I think that's like the little differences or people, people here actually have been really nice. We once like Good. got settled in. I like, I like Texas. It's actually a really nice place. To but do you feel that like I- that's a lot to do with who you are as a person? If you were the type of person that is just coming in with a little bit of a bad energy and like kind of nervous and just oh oh I'm in a new country I'm not going to succeed I think the universe is going to reflect that back on you but the fact that it seems like you're coming in confident you feel like you deserve a seat in this law class just as much as anyone else and I think people will respect and you know what that. you're so right like, mm-hmm. like what you just said like that's been like you you didn't like, act I told like you. you shouldn't be there well, I'm telling you, I've been on both ends. Like immediately I came here, it was just that intense anxiety. Like for a while, it was so bad. Like I'm telling you, actually, there was a time I remember going like almost three months. I hadn't talked to a single person. Like it's just like, what? Well, yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't really know how she stopped me. And she asked me, how are you? And I realized I hadn't talked to someone in so long. And I wanted to start crying. Uh-huh. Like, it was just like, I found recently, especially like being able to start speaking up for myself being able to start a business being able to do all that the universe really does give you back what you put into it you have to take a lot of chances you have to grow and it has to be very uncomfortable Mm -hmm. because that's really how you grow it really comes from a lot of discomfort it you're not just going to sit in your comfort zone and good things happen to you Mm -hmm. because that's just just the same things that have been happening to you keep happening to you so i really think it's really you have to go with that open mind and you, it's how you see the world that's reflected back at you, really. Agreed, agreed. Talk to me about some of the struggles that you had when you first moved here, though. Maybe just the nature of being in law school, maybe nature yeah. of just like living in Houston. Any struggles that come top of mind? Um, I know on transportation, like I didn't have a car. Right. And Houston is horrible. Houston, like the buses never go anywhere on time. Like if you're using the bus in Houston, you just hate yourself because it never goes anywhere on time. It's uncomfortable. You're late everywhere. It's just. Oh. What did yeah. you do? Did and you I was finally working. getting a car. I finally got the car. But I remember I tried to take the bus to work. Like literally when I got a car, it took me 20 minutes to get to work. It used to take me like almost an hour, 30 minutes because there wasn't wow. even a street bus there. Like it goes around in circles. So just like my first job, I was paying like $12 an hour, right. but I was so grateful for it. 
So I remember like getting on that bus at 7 a.m. so I could make it at 9 a.m. at work. And <laughs> I like think about all those things. You know, that kind of made me interesting. Or like, um, and my friend would try to go grocery shopping and we'd get like an Uber together or we'd get like on the bus together. It's just, you, I mean, once you grow from that, I think it really helps you as a person because once you grow from that, you start to appreciate like little things. You can think you you appreciate so much, so you'll take care of your car more because you know if this breaks down, we're the alternative of it. Yeah, you start to like really enjoy the little things. You're like, oh my god, I can drive to the grocery sh- and drive back home. You know, it gives you appreciate what a luxury. <laughs> exactly, it's like okay, that is good. I had a good day today. I was able to buy my groceries. I was able to come home. Bang. So I think it really lets you, and that really is what makes a good life because really recently it's I've been trying to, yes, I've been really trying to, you know, fight anxiety, fight a lot of doubts, fight just things that made me so unhappy. So I've been trying to do a lot of mind work, trying to read more, just try to focus on what makes the better life because I realized while working at my last job I was still as unhappy as I was when I was at my unhappiest that it's just you have to grow if you're in a better position now you have to be a little happier than the last time so it really wasn't getting an extra what how much a month that was making that was going to make me happy that wasn't going to make me happy so I had to really take a step back and think about okay how can I learn to control my mind? And I think a lot of it goes back to really learning to control your mind. Yeah, I hear that a lot. So you did four years of law school at your university. Was it hard getting that first job? Because you, you mentioned you need a job within 90 days. So, or did you have a seamless process? Uh, no. What type of law did you study? Well, I just, so you just study generally. Okay. You can pick your classes. I picked mostly business class because I wanted to be a transactional lawyer, which is funny. A transactional lawyer is a lawyer and I never go to court. (laughs) That is how I define it. It really isn't. It's really like you have to specialize in something, but I wanted transactional law. Like I told you, I was very nervous. I didn't want to speak out in public. I didn't want to do any of that. So I almost got this really good transactional job that was just going to make me really, really comfortable. It paid well. And I lost the job like a few months after taking the bar. Not a few months, a few weeks after taking the bar. Why? And then I had to, well, it was just kind of my fault and let things lag for a long time. So I was just thinking, okay, what am I going to do? And I just applied to a bunch of jobs and I took the first thing that came because I was like almost at my 90 days. And so I was like, that okay. must be a, a the- tough position to be in because everyone else is interviewing at a bunch of jobs and kind of picking and choosing, but you don't get that luxury of picking and choosing being no, in another don't. country. No, you don't. You just really, and they didn't ask any questions. And you know what is also bad? Like a lot of jobs will ask you like, oh, do you need a visa to stay here? Just as a way of weeding you out. It's not completely legal. Yeah. But like it happens. Like you see it on applications. I'm like, there's a reason they're asking that. <laughs> so you, th- you um, think they'll like biasly not choose you because they don't want to deal with all the visas? They don't want to deal with That's shitty. everything employers want to do. But it's, you have to think it also makes sense that a lot of them, they're just like trying to pay as little as possible and get someone for that amount. So it doesn't make sense to their bottom line to keep you on there if they have to pay extra for you because they have to go through this whole, whole immigration process. Understood. And at the end, it's also a lottery, which I didn't even mention before. So there's no guarantee you're going to stay in the country if they're trying to get you an H-1B visa. So Explain for them, that it's to also me. like a risk. Well, it's even very, it's very, I'll say I don't understand it completely, but what happens is they apply for a visa for you and then it has to be picked. There's a certain number that is picked them a year. Okay. For the fiscal year. I'm not an immigration attorney. So and based really on what? The specific. Just a bunch of factors. Yeah. They call it a lottery. So to me, that tells you all you need to know about it. Am I lucky enough this year to stay in this country? So, wow. yeah. That's it, nerve wracking. Exactly. So I think for the employer today, it's kind of some risk. Because you, what if I get this person and they're not able to stay in this country? So usually they, they ask questions. Because the truth is, once you get out of school, you're allowed to stay a year here just without getting on the special lottery or anything or three years if you're an engineer. Once you have that first job, it's usually a year working visa. Is that what it is? Yes, they give you a year working visa for just experience. So you're allowed to do that if you're like in my field, like law, 
normal field, the social sciences, you get a year. If you're in the STEM sciences, you get three years. So Got normally it. you can get that long. Well, jobs kind of start asking after three years, will you need sponsorship? Because that's what you need from them. So they still use that to weed you out anyway, even if you have three years. Even if it's three years from now, oh my goodness. Exactly. I'm like, your employees say we'll see three years. Stop asking. (laughs) So So um, should an applicant lie and say, no, I don't need visas and just wait until the three years come? Like, is that what people do? that's kind of risky. It is risky. Because normally you also have like weird documents. It's not like you have the normal... um, work application you have to show them like your visa so i think in the end they can't uh, okay you so exactly. you'll, i've heard stories you of out. people yeah i've heard stories of people like lying about it that they get fired anyway so Shit. <laughs> and that's actually like good grounds for them to fire you they're like oh she, she lied about that so so talk to me about just your your job situation and your career so far so yeah, you've been an attorney for a year, but now you're not an attorney anymore. So <laughs> what's going on? Well, so what happened was, so I told you, okay, my first job out of law school, I was kind of right on my 90 days. I got that right. job. I was like, okay, I was trying to be a transactional attorney because I never wanted to step my feet in court. And I then think you'd the be job, badass in court. Well, the job I got they ended up being like a job. It, they're like, can you start tomorrow? And it's like just a pure litigation job. You have to be in court. Like amazing, well, yes. So you were so scared. I was afraid, but I showed up there every day afraid. And my next job was even more of a litigation job because I worked for debt collectors and for banks, which was also very draining because it's kind of you have to deal with people that are in debt, people that are in. So you're in a job where you're going to court and you're on the bank side arguing that this person yeah, yeah, owes you money. Side. Mm-hmm. And it's actually That's a soul it's a crisis sucking in job. No, it, it's soul sucking because it's a volume work job. Someone comes with an Excel sheet with, I don't know, 300 names and they like sue all these people. It's yeah. actually a crisis in this country because That's there's so many That's heartbreaking because there's so many reasons why these people, like it's a system problem usually. Oh, it goes even like worse than that because what usually happens sometimes is, so let's say you go to Bank of America and Bank of America approves a loan for you and you're not able to pay it eventually. So what happens is Bank of America sells this loan to someone else because they can't get any money from you. You can't pay. And so people just keep selling that loan until someone buys it that's ready to go after you. So sometimes you actually have defenses and a lot of people don't know that. So really, that's really what got to me. So it's not even the ones you had to fight. It's the ones where people just don't do anything and it ends up ruining their lives because it's something that can stay with you for a very long time, especially if you don't show up. And there's just people that don't show up. They don't know what to do. They can't afford an attorney. An attorney is really expensive. I, I mean, mean they, if they they're going step, to debt collectors. Of course, they're not going to have their own representation. No, and they don't even show up. And the truth is, if you don't show up, no matter what the debt collector sees, the debt collector wins. Even if that case was a case that could not be won just by you showing up, they get everything. And I was just like, why are people not showing up? That really did, like, it got to me. I was like, why are Do people you not Do you think if up? the the person getting sued, the person that owes the money, like the citizen, is there any case that they could win? Well, yes. There are, like, very obvious defenses. Like, for one, if the debt is too old, like in Texas, four years. If you waited longer than four years, which is something that would happen because they've been selling these debts to different people. So let's say you owe the Bank of America $60,000. Bank of America writes it off, gets a tax break. They sell it to someone for, I don't know, $6,000. The person's, oh, I don't want to bother with this. The person sells it to someone else for like $60. Well, it never gets that low, but you get the point. Mm-hmm. It's like heavily discounted at that point. So the person got $60. Maybe the person bought it for $60. But well, the person is going to go after the debt for the whole $60,000 for the entire balance plus interest. That's accrued over the four years time, five years time that it took where this loan was going from hand to hand. So at that time, it's like a huge amount. It's almost double of what the person initially owed. And they go after you for everything. They're like trying to like clear all your bank accounts. So if the second you don't answer in court, they can go to your bank. They can garnish your accounts. Like once they get that final judgment. And I think it was like, that that to me just seems really unfair. I'm like, okay, you know what? If... If this person like the debt is already written off, just like why are you still fighting this person to get paid? 
Yeah, to me, it's really kind of... And I mean, the person did take the debts, but at that point, there's so much that has happened that makes it so unfair. And the person usually has a defense if four years has passed. If four years has passed because they waited too late, the statute of limitation has passed, and you can't legally sue the person for the debt, or you can't legally recover for the debt. You can only, like, you can harass... Well, not harass. Harassment is actually a crime, but you can call the person and try to get a person to pay the debt. But you really can't sue the person and go take the person's property and all that. The person kind of uh, get out of jail free card after four years. But what happens is like people go and they sue you after four years and the person doesn't even answer. The person doesn't show up because people get this thing. They get sued. Someone serves them and they're like overwhelmed. And that's how people deal with debt generally. They're just, okay, I'm not going to look into this. You know how people just don't look into their bank accounts. People don't know how much they owe. They have so much going on. There's so much money people are leaving on the table. Usually, that's why I really started financial coaching because I'm like, you literally can do things. Even if you owe money, you can find ways to get in front of it. You can find ways to negotiate those things. Like eventually, when I work with people and we reach out to the bank, they don't pay the full amount. They're able to get breaks. They're able to get mm-hmm. longer time. To but do you think they they don't even want to deal with it because they don't want to <laughs> deal with it? Like Exactly. That's yeah. it. People, and they don't know they can't deal with it. They, I guess at that and point, it scares them. Hopeless. And as days yes. and days pass, like it becomes this bigger problem and it gets scary. Exactly. It's like that tax bill you never just open. So at that point, they're still coming for those people, but they're just getting so overwhelmed that they're not really coming out and doing anything. And if you actually came out and did something, you could have really saved yourself a lot of headache in the future because you owing a debt is something, but someone having a judgment against you is really powerful because... What does that, that mean, stuff, a judgment against you? Like they're suing you? Is that what that means? Yes, like if they go to court and uh, you go that's answer and they get a judgment, yes, it's valid for 10 years and you can renew it. So like potentially for the rest of your life, like that person could come after you 10 years later if you make some money, the person can go into your bank account and take it all. So it's really like wow. that long-term significance that's just dangerous because you don't, you might be in a bad position to be. Like some people don't care too because they're like, right now I don't have anything. Well, are you thinking about 10 years? They don't realize that they can still come after you when you do have something. Exactly. So really And that is state-specific that you're talking it's, about right now. It's very state-specific. Yeah. So the... The defenses are state specific, but what happens generally, it's happening nationally. Like I actually also just joined an av- advocate attorneys group. I just joined a group that's trying to solve this problem because it's a major crisis. Like the debt industry is making like $14 billion a year. Like it's really easy to get yeah. on it. I watched this thing where someone said, all you need to do is pay $50, form a company, buy some debt. You're going to harass people. You get all their information and get them to pay that debt. So it's really lucrative. And they, you know, there's a high profit margin that you can buy something for $60 and make, I don't know, 10 thousand, times what you bought it for. Thousand, yeah. yeah, thousand times what you bought it for. So it's a really lucrative What industry. companies are doing this? Like what, who are the main debt collectors in the States? I think Midland Funding is one I hear all the time. Who banks did you represent the most now. when you were an attorney? Mostly just the banks? Yeah, mostly just the banks. Right now, I'm an e-consumer attorney, so I'm also helping people negotiate against the banks now. But right. yeah, mo- like I mostly represented the banks. And it's a very easy case for the banks because if you can't raise defenses or if you don't show up, you kind of, it's kind of like shooting a dead dog. A lot of people just don't know what to do. And it's horrible because, you know, if you don't know what to do. You really can't help yourself. When you were in that job and maybe sometimes where the consumer would show up, what is usually the reason they're in debt? Is it medical? Is it consumer debt? What is it usually? So well, I did mostly business debt. And usually okay. because the business failed. A lot of people start Small businesses like, you know, or big businesses? Yeah, small business. Because, you know, a lot of small businesses feel now. You're taking like, out loans, right? Yeah, they're taking out loans. They are really like optimistic. Or, and sometimes the business goes well for a while. And those are well, the ones that were actually kind of like painful because they paid up for a very long time. By the end, they're still owing a lot of money because these things add up. And how it works also, if you're in that position, in the, in the contracts, the bank usually say, you know, if we're, we have to chase you for a debt, you also have to pay our attorney's fees. So on top of that, you also have to pay the attorneys that, are working for the bank. So it's just like, it's snowballing. You're just like going deeper and deeper into it. How do you get it? It happens to consumers. 
it's it's overwhelming. It makes sense why so, they don't show up because it sounds like they show up. It's yeah. gonna get worse and worse. Well, the thing it's is, meant. really, but the truth is, showing up is really the best thing you can do because at least. But okay, actually, I would say the people that showed up also didn't know what to do, so they just stopped showing up. How do you empower the consumer? Well, I guess that's why you eventually switched roles. So for the audience who's a little lost and kind of figuring out what's going on. So Damola used to work as an attorney fighting consumers for debt that they owed the bank. So she'd be on the bank side. That was her job as an attorney. And now she's recently left that job. How long ago did you leave the job? I think a couple of months ago in May, actually. Okay, really so it's recently. very recent. So now yeah. Mola is more trying to educate people on debt and being financially responsible and trying to show them, like, if you're in this situation, like, how could you make this situation better? So now she's kind of exactly. advocating for the other side. Yeah. So I think it's also knowing the right people to reach out to because some attorneys that don't even practice consumer law, they may not be very helpful in this circumstance because they don't know what to do. It's a very, it's a very specific kind of law. It's not just a general practice. So you have to know like your defenses. You have to know if the bank did something wrong because sometimes so these banks are doing things wrong or they don't even know how much you owe them. You'll be surprised. Like it's actually very common with a lot of debt collectors. They're not sure how much you owe. They're just guessing. And, you know, well, the information I told you this solely from so many people. No one really right. knows what's the don't actually anymore. have the information. They don't really wow, have okay. it. So the problem is also if they can't prove something in court, they can't win it. So if you show up and you ask them for more specific information, if they can't prove it, that's also how you can get out of you can it. Win. Because sometimes the banks don't even care when they're selling to debt collectors. They don't care to give them the information because they're like, I'm selling it to you at the discount. And sometimes, you know, they're able to make their profits because they call some people and they pay up immediately. Mm -hmm. So the business still works for debt collectors because they call some people and they pay immediately. But some people, and they also found out, oh, we can just send this to attorneys and attorneys will sue everyone at least because they've actually perfected the whole court system process. They go through smaller courts, the county courts here in Texas. It's cheaper to get into. And you can just kind of sue a lot of people at the same time. Like literally, I, I was watching a video where they said like some attorneys, they look at each case for at least four seconds, just four seconds, make that decision, sue that person. So they actually streamline the whole process. So it's so easy to sue so many people at the same time. Oh my God, and so awesome. the, Yeah. There's it's, so it's much a, wrong with the system. There's so much wrong with it. And they, people need to realize, okay, I can do something about this. Once they realize they can do something about this, there's in like so much of a better position. And understanding the case and understanding if the bank is able to prove, the debt collector is able to prove that you owe the debt. There's still so much you can do. You can negotiate it. You can negotiate it to pay less. Like you can, you can actually give them a hard time about it. You can try to invoke things in the original contract. There are always kind of safeguards for you if you know what to do. But mm -hmm. people usually don't know what to do at that point and they just kind of disappear. That's just the interesting. Worst so now you're on the consumer advocacy side. So are you working with individuals or are you kind of educating people as a whole? I'm doing both. I'm okay. working with individuals. So I when have, you like, deal with an individual, what are you helping them with? Are they coming to you saying, I kind of have this debt that I owe and like, I don't really know what to do with it? And if so, what is usually the debt that they have? Is it medical? Is it consumer credit cards? Like, what is it? Student loans? Like, what is it usually? Like, what's the big the, debt problem? I would say medical. There's a lot of medical. I didn't yeah. know that because I mostly practice business. But, like, medical is so horrible. One. It's just such it's, it, an incredible amount. And usually I, there's a lot of things that can help you if immediately you're in medical debt. You, you can ask the hospitals for different programs. They'll help you afford it more. But the thing is, once too much time passes, there's less and less you can do. So a lot of times people come to me after so much time has passed. So a lot of things you could have done in the first place, you can't really do them right now. But we still try to find other ways around it, try to find if there are any violations. If that debt is actually valid, it's usually about negotiating. But you have to figure out if the debt is valid. And you help first. the consumer negotiate it, whether the debt down or whether get rid of it all and just write it exactly. off. Exactly. Like if we can get rid of it all, that's always the best case. We're always and do you talk directly all. with where they owe it to? Like, are you almost acting as their lawyer? So that's, yeah. But that's if they hire me through my law firm. I have to do this. It's not I have right. a law firm and I have my financial coaching company. 
So if they hire me as the attorney, I would negotiate it on their behalf. Like I'll actually call up the attorneys on the other side. They usually come when there's already been a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So I'll call up the attorneys on the other side and see what we can work out and see if the is actually valid. And so that's what happens at that point. But for the coaching side, it's more of people that are looking to make a lifestyle change, mm -hmm. looking to see where they can save these things, looking to see if they can reduce the interest rate. So sometimes they're able to actually just call up the banks. People ask, I always say like, you'll be so surprised what the phone call can do if you actually get the right person to talk to. Right. Like you can actually try to negotiate those interest rates. You can look into personal loans. You can look into things that will make the debt paying process easier on your finances. So you're not paying interest for the rest of your life. You can look for ways to like cut off that interest, look for ways to restructure your debts. Like a lot of people, and it's also very common that people don't know what they owe. So like right. just putting that out of Why paper. Why don't people know what they owe? That, like that yeah, I, I, I understand it. There are things I never want to deal with. <laughs> like the first time I bought the house, they want to see what the whole appraisal was. Well, not the appraisal, the, um, when they send you the district appraisal, well, like eventually I figured out how you can negotiate it because that's also something you can negotiate with your district. But, um, I understand that instinct. You kind of want to wait till the last minute. You're like, do you think they're afraid to know how bad it is? Yeah, I think people are afraid to know how bad it is because it's really just like, I don't know how I can get out of this. But what, and it's also like, they think it's so complicated. They think it's a lot more complicated than it is. But once you write it down, you realize, okay, this is what is happening. This is this interest rate. This is why I'm paying this much. This is how much I could be paying instead. So writing it down is always just that first breakthrough exercise. Just write it down, know how much interest you're paying. Yeah, know exactly. It's so simple, like. but so few people do it. Like people are just kind of hoping for the best. That financially, I think because a lot of things sound more complicated than it is. The whole interest rate, the whole invest. They, you just, people look people are like, scared. People, I find a lot of times are choosing to be ignorant about it. Uh, I think people are saying they just don't want to think about it. I know, but isn't that such a, don't you think that's just like a really silly way to live? Like money is what makes the world go around. So if you don't understand it, then how do you expect to participate? That's true. So see, that's how you're thinking about it. Well, people think very differently. I, I know. Mean, Give me some scenarios of what you chat about to the people that you work with. What kind of situations are they in? Like what's their money mindset? A lot of people at some point, so they were living off their credit cards. And the credit card debt, once you get into it, it just kind of buries you in. And for a long time, they suddenly realize when it's so much. You're like, oh my God, I'm owing so much money. I'm owing more than I make. This down. Exactly. They're like, even if I paid my whole salary for this year, I wouldn't pay down that debt. So, you know. So what kind of numbers are we thinking? The people that you work with, like how much debt are they in? I've seen a lot. I've seen like 90 grand, I think. Yeah. Uh, but credit card debt. It was like credit card abstinence and medical. People like usually all like a mix. So it's uh, really like, like at that point, there's, there's so much debt. There's really anything could help. And I've seen people that owe so much to you know, I'm not really willing to work more to pay this off. I don't know how I can. You have to make a little more money to pay that off because at that point, there's only so much you can cut from your budget because that's the first thing we try to do. We try to cut some from your budget. But it's only so much you can do. But there's also a time where you can literally pick up your car, go pick up food for someone and get paid. So I'm like, okay, if you could set aside three hours, four hours a week, like those little things. Like your debt could be paid off. Debt. Exactly. But you, exactly. you think a lot of people aren't willing to do it. Some people Why? are if you show them how it works. But some people are just like, I can't do that. I can't handle that. And that's usually the type of people that get into that debt in the first place. It's really like, I just can't handle that. I don't see how that will help me. So It really is something... a mindset thing, hey? Yeah, it's kind of. Like if you already thing. have it in your mind, like I'm not going to get out of this debt, then you just determine the outcome already. You chose the outcome. And people want to be right too. They're like, see, I told you I wasn't going to get out of debt. And it's like, who is that serving? I mean, like, and that's the truth. A lot of people don't know you have to make sacrifices. You're not, you're not just going to like keep That's being the, the word no one up. wants to do. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you have to change something. And I see it happening a lot to these days, especially like I'm trying to start a business now. Like people just want to do something for one day and see results. Mm -hmm. Well, you're and really not going to see results in a day. I'm not going to see results. You might not even see it in a year. You have to. And you, there are envious of people that they see have made things for themselves. I'm like, that's what's facing personal bankruptcy. The person was showing up every day, making zero. Like you have to understand that it really takes 
a lot of grit and it really takes a lot of being in circumstances most people are not. You have to be an unusual person to get an unusual result. So if you want to be in the status quo, you want to like stay with that, you want to stay with all that. Then like, so be it. That's fine. Yes. Well, you have to know, like, if you're ready to make a decision to change your life, you have to be a different type of person. Like the person that got you into all those problems, that's the old you. You can't keep being the old you. And it's going to be really <laughs> uncomfortable. But those are the only people that make it out. I completely so. agree. I find I know so many people that they think, oh, I want to make more money. I want to I want to do this. But I'm like, you're not willing to do a single thing differently. <laughs> Like oh my you, God, you so want to, you're not willing to work past 5 p.m. You're not willing to get up earlier and do anything about it. You're not willing to say no to going to dinner this week with your friends. Like, exactly. If you got it. You got to change something. If you, like you said, if you want to get somewhere you haven't been, you have to do something you haven't done. Exactly. I'm telling you, and that's the thing I read a lot about, like people who have been successful because I'm trying on my journey myself. And I find it incredible, like the things these people had to do. Like a lot of them, actually have to be like really dark places and you have to really sit down with yourself and ask yourself am I willing to make this type of sacrifices because if that's the type of success you're looking at you should also be looking at the type of things they had to overcome mm. it's really eye-opening because sometimes I'm like you know most of the people I admire I'm like god if I was in that position what would I do like they were you had to like, like crap for years exactly yeah and they were like in situations where like they're like on the verge of bankruptcy they have to be putting so much in the business just because they believed in it so it's yeah. like nothing looked like it was working it didn't look like it was going to be successful but it's just that like unshakable faith and that's what I'm trying to build right now like I'm trying to build that resilience like you have to keep showing up even when no one cares you have to keep going you have to be keep doing things and everything comes as a result of compound interest in the end it's not any one day you showed up but no. it's the you guys, it's of consistency and a thousand days yeah. uh, so a thousand days people don't the same understand thing. That. Okay, i think the analogy that people do understand when you're thinking about that is fitness so no you're not going to get the best body That's you true. want by going for one long run today but if you do a, a small run for the next six months every day or, or just a lot more consistently throughout six months, you're going to achieve it. Exactly. I think that's the way to think about it. And a lot of people don't, don't think about that with money or budgets or career success. Yeah. They, they want it all you know today. And I think also like marketing is making people like think discomfort isn't where it's supposed to be. Like A lot of times you see like an ad. And you're literally having me making calls and, you know, no one has answered. And I'm like, you started your business yesterday. Why are you listening to that? It's like people, people are like, oh yeah, nothing has worked. How long have you been trying it? Mm -hmm. So you need to try things for a long time before you decide it don't work. And I think that's also something I try to learn because I'm trying to help my clients see when they're just being manipulated and then to know that you just don't have to keep up with people all the time. And it really just comes also from finding your own fulfillment, finding your own center, what works for your life, who you want to be. Really, when you know that, you stop trying to impress people. A lot of, a lot of money down problems, so that would help you solve it. It's like being happy with yourself. That's one that I can echo. It's the impressing other people. What is that mm. quote? It's stop spending money on things that you don't want to impress people that you don't care about. You know, True, and it's always it. the people we don't give a shit about. We we don't even want to be hanging out with them. <laughs> and exactly. we're, we're buying a brand new outfit to be able to hang out with them. We're pretending that we're richer than we are. So they see us differently. Like, fuck that. You know, exactly. That's, That's how we get ourselves is. into debt. And it's the, the craziest thing is, is they're probably feeling the same thing. So it's sorry. We're spending all this money just to pretend to be friends. Let's just not be friends. <laughs> and we'll both be better <laughs> off. I know. Eventually, I think everyone hits that point in their life when they realize, yeah, I shouldn't be doing that. I hope everyone hits that point in their life when they realize. I've been there before, no like buying yeah. things and, and doing things and buying expensive dinners that I, I couldn't afford just to kind of fit in places. I'm sure a lot yeah. of people feel that way. And I regret them all. <laughs> But I, yeah, I, mean, I found yeah. there, there, it takes a lot of power and a lot of confidence to be able to say, hey, no, I actually can't afford that place. I'll catch you the next time. Or if you want to go somewhere different, I'm, I'm happy to do that instead. Or, you know, hey, oh, yeah, you're all going on that trip. Ah, I can't afford it this month. 
and just not going on the trip. But so many people will still go on the trip because they're afraid to miss out. And it's there's That's other ways true. to build connections, build friendships that doesn't have to cost a ton of money. And there, I think the real friends are not expecting you to do that anyways. Yeah, I think there's a lot that goes into it. Like sometimes it's insecurity. Sometimes it's defining yourself as some type of person and you just don't want to be someone that can't afford it. You really just have to find out who you are and how you want to live life and what makes life happy for you. I realized a long time ago I was not that person. Like I remember being in college in Nigeria and I want to impress people. But for a long time, I just realized, you know, that's not me. I'm very introverted. I want to be alone. I love reading books. I'm like going to stick to what I know. Mm. And it took me a while to realize that was okay. You don't have to do what you don't want to do. You got to find the people that like the same things you like and are, are okay exactly. with just kind of doing their own thing as well. And once you see other people doing that and you realize, oh, not everyone goes to this party on this day, then you feel a little bit more comfortable and confident in who you are. And with the internet now, it's kind of easier because there's like all this movement, like the fire movement, like the people that want to retire early. Yeah. I love it. I know what my goals are. They're trying mm-hmm. to invest their money rather than buying into like luxury items. I wouldn't really bring them any. That They're wouldn't bring them any with profit. kind of not wanting those things anymore because they really exactly. Like- so now you know you're not crazy. If you thought you were crazy, you can go online and you know you can find some people, people that are like you. Exactly. So. I want to ask you a little bit about uh, what you're struggling with now as uh, a new entrepreneur. I think I'm sure time entrepreneur. Yeah, it's it's a lot. It's everything, really. But it's also like having enough faith in what you're doing to continue. Because I will say as a new entrepreneur, some days are good. Some days are like, okay, it looks like I have a valid idea. It looks like things are happening. But some days you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. I need to get a job. And it's also about sometimes well-meaning people try to get you to implement what they think your success should be. Give like you example. get a lot of advice from everywhere. Like, I, I don't know if this is what they call the shiny object syndrome. You're like an entrepreneur. Like, yes. okay, I should try All this new thing. entrepreneurs have shiny objects. <laughs> Stop that. <Yeah. laughs> I should try this. I should try that. And they're like, oh, maybe this is why I'm not making any money. No, you're not making any money because you've only been in business for a week. So, like, stop that. Stop thinking it's immediate. And I think also we should normalize the fact that starting out, you're not going to be profitable. You're actually going to lose money starting out because you're going to be investing in educating yourself. Mm -hmm. You're going to be investing in learning new skills. So I think it's really just believing enough to keep continuing. You're Mm -hmm. going to be investing in learning how to sell. So really, it's just about learning how much value you're putting out. Like, for a while, you have to be willing to listen to people I get a few people to work with. I'm not charging like as much as I would have charged if I was like working on that law firm. So to me, I'm like, how much money can I make? Is this profitable? Mm -hmm. But you have to learn to start from somewhere. You have to to take the baby steps. You have to learn the baby steps are okay. So a lot of people are just expecting instant gratification, but you're really not going to get it. And it's also very lonely feeling. Because you're no longer in this safety net working with people, tell you what to do, making sure you're paid every day. Mm-hmm. They're literally going to have to find how you make your money. I think only strong people should do it because you're going to yeah. doubt yourself a lot. So, I well, think you, right now, you yeah. said normally you would have described yourself as a very risk adverse person, but now do you find yourself taking risk all over the place? I think I took a really big risk for something. Yeah, quitting everything. Everything really has been a risk, but I've found that I grow. I rise very quickly from risk. Like, I think I'm falling, but at some point I realize, oh, I could do this. Then you become that person who has done that. And so it really just, it adds to your esteem. It helps you build yourself up. It adds to your confidence. You're able to do more things more quickly. And you learn that, okay, you have to take, and I guess this is what people say, take action. Everyone sees it, but it's, it's true. A lot of times we're stuck in this learning loop. We always have bosses. Like I learned I had to stop procrastinating by learning. I was also mm-hmm. someone that was like learning a lot. <laughs> so, okay, I'm learning. I'm learning. But I have to realize. Okay, you got to like, start doing. You're learning, you make but nobody's money. going to see it. Exactly. Yeah, nobody's going to see it. You're not going to make any money. So it's also challenging yourself a lot. But I think it really helps you grow as a person because you became that person who could do all these things. Mm. And then less things that moving you so much less things that make you so anxious so when you were first starting out or taking the leap from traditionally employed to self-employed 
Were there any books or podcasts or anything that you listened to that really gave you the confidence to take the leap? Uh, yeah, I had to. <laughs> I, I did. I listened to a lot. I mean, so the first one I actually listened to was Naval Ravika. It's like I was saying, okay. he has a book that I also read. What he said made a lot of sense to me because, okay, why I was in this job is not because I love the Sudetas. I was actually just looking for a way to, to make money. Mm-hmm. And he talked about how you can actually build wealth. The act of building wealth, what wealth is, is really just, yeah, transferring something valuable to people. So it's kind of, it makes the world equation simple. So listening to that, I think I listened to that six months before I quit my job. I remember, so one morning I was listening to this podcast that all he said just made so much sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I started questioning my life at that point. I'm like, what am I doing? You're so, having an existential uh, crisis. Exactly. So I think Naval Ravikant's podcast, I don't know if you listen to, um, there's this one, Tom Bilyeu, Impact Theory. I really like that one. So okay. it's really about mindset, about motivating yourself. I think for the first month that I quit my job, I was listening to that every day because I was just like so afraid. So I wake up in the morning and I'm like cleaning the house, washing the dishes. I'm like listening to episodes back to back to sure, back. You're getting a little neurotic. Yeah. Can... <laughs> yeah. And there's this, also this guy is like a high performance coach, Brendan Burchard. He's really good. I love his episodes too. I just, I listen to a lot. I read a lot of books. I started to read a lot about investing. Right now, I think reading is what I really has grounded me the most, like reading mm-hmm. a lot because there's also so much doubt that creeps into my mind sometimes. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to read a story of someone who did something amazing. Mm-hmm. And reading mostly about entrepreneurial journeys or just about mindset shift. Or um, invest in how to actually make money, how to mm-hmm. actually make enough money to retire, I would say, because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for like the type of money that gives you freedom. Yeah. To me, I realized freedom was more important than money. To me, and that's why it really all changed. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And for me, when you mentioned the word retirement, a concept that I've taken on a lot recently is retirement is not an age. It's a dollar amount. You can retire exactly. whenever you want. It's traditionally it's been 65 because back in the day, your pension would be high enough that you could retire with the, with what was saved in your pension. But now it's that's not the way of life anymore. Anytime people say they're going to work till they're 65, I'm like, I don't think you still won't have enough. Like the exactly like, it's not going to be anything saved. These days, it's all changed. So I think that was the old model. That was like the industrial age. That was where. People depended on your employer. These days, it's really not a feasible plan. You do have You're to have do a it plan yourself. for retirement. Yeah, your employer you is not saving your ass. You're not even loyal to you anymore. No loyalty. You someday. So, so, yeah. So, right now, you actually have to be fighting for yourself, making your own financial plan. And it's really it's too complicated, but you do need a financial plan. If you're going to retire, if you're going to do all that, you need to know how much you're paying in debt. You need to know how much you're investing. You need to have a plan. It's not going to fall in your lap by mistake. You're just going to end up working for the rest of your life. So I want to do things I only want to do. I don't want to do things for more and more. So that's really what investing is going to also be for me. A big mindset that has changed for me is stop trading time for money. Time is the only asset that you don't get back. And the more you trade time for money, it's not an equation that's going to end up the way you want it. No, You're not going to retire if you just keep trading time for money because that means you're going to be working for the rest of your life. You need to have your money work for oh you. Oh my God, yes. Another thing, like I'm still from Naval, he says we live in an age of infinite leverage. You can always amplify your efforts in these days. You can start up things that grow past, like creating passive income is also something I'm working on right now. It's really hard at first, but you can basically create something that like media code, like things that are going to work for the rest of your lives for you. Like you have to actually hire people to make money. Look at people that are making money right now. You know, when when we're younger, it's of go to school, do this. That's how you make some money. But That's look not at the richest people right anymore. now. Look at people that are enjoying their lives. They're like people who just stuck to what they wanted to do and they did it. And now they're like probably on YouTube making so much money. And the world yeah. has changed so much. And I still think a majority of people are operating on the old ways. And you gotta stop that. You gotta you gotta throw that money mindset out. You gotta, you gotta you gotta wake up and live in the world that we're living in. You have to realize you have to learn skills that are not so easy for them to train people for because those are the jobs that go first. You have to learn to create income by creating value. 
you can create passive income now. And almost anybody can do it. It takes a bit of effort. But look at people like, people without formal education are very good at doing it because they learn to bootstrap themselves. They learn, okay, I'm going to do all this. And you see them like building empires, building so much money. And the thing is, once you get that initial amount and you're able to invest something, that's the, I think the only truly passive way to make money is investing. Because everything else, they're telling you it's passive, but you have to put a lot of work into it. It's like you can't just set up a dropshipping store or sell yeah, it. Yeah, it could take a month, months take some of work before exactly. it becomes passive. So even if you're writing a book, you have to write a book for a long time. Even if you're starting like a podcast or starting a YouTube, it takes a while for those things to kick off. But like eventually it's going to pay off. That's, that's actually what happens. If you don't give up, it will pay off. But investing is different because you can buy, buy into an index fund, you're getting 7 to 10% returns every year. It's so passive. Like you can automate it. There are apps now that do that. You don't really have to do anything. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you had so much money, like people that make money from doing something in mass media. So a lot of people, and they put that in the stock market. They're basically fit. They can retire, put it in the stock market. And that's all. With the returns, I know. So, yeah. So really... It's all different now. You're really not making that much money. Like I see people like working as attorneys, working as doctors. They're still in a lot of debt. They still, they're still not free, basically. So it's really the old model. And you're not serving anybody anymore. You're better off just like sticking to what you know and trying to make money out of it. So it's a different world. Damola, I want to ask you a couple more questions before I let you go. The first question to add on to what we were just talking about what does financially free look like to you? Well, to me, financially free is really just doing what I want, being able to do what I enjoy and having enough in my investments to cover my lifestyle at that point. And when you get to that point, what does life look like for you? When you wake up and choose everything, what does that look like? I think it's always going to change. Right now, it looks like I can go anywhere I want. I travel anywhere I want. I'm able to do what I want. And to me, being free also involves making impact. I love to work. Well, not work in the traditional sense, but like I'm always working on some project. I like to make an impact. I like to feel like that's where I get my sense of meaning. And I'm like, okay, I want to be doing something for someone that matters. So to me, if I retired, I'll probably be writing a book somewhere or trying to start a coaching business somewhere, just doing something that makes an impact to people. So I think investing is just really about having never to work again with the mm -hmm. hopes of I'm going to make money, but having um, the freedom to do what I want to do, even if it doesn't make any money. I just want to right. do things. <laughs> Agreed. Damola, any final last words of advice that you want to leave the audience with? If you have something you want to do, you should just be consistent at it. There is no magic words to it. Everyone that you see who is successful is because at some point they didn't quit. And I think that's something we should normalize. We should normalize that life is hard. But if you keep going, you're going to be able to make something for yourself. Agreed. Amen to that. Damola, it's been an absolute pleasure. I feel like you and I could talk money many more times. As, as we keep getting a little bit more financially free, we'll have to trade some secrets because yes. I'm still trading time for money, but setting myself up for a time that I don't. But in the meantime, it's very fun talking to guests like you and learning about their money struggles and immigration and debt stories and it's all very relatable so thank you so much for being here thank you so much for having me i really enjoyed this <laughs>